I'm Randy Hamilton. I'm the superintendent for Sanitation Safety Subunit Facility Services. And uh, I handle uh, all our pest control on campus. I oversee it. We've got some guys that actually handle most of it anymore. Uh, also do some environmental work for university and and that. Back when uh, I was asked to do this, uh, there were several directions that I thought about going, but uh, mosquitoes started popping up on the news about the Zika virus and all that was going on with that. And I don't think that in the 25 years I've been doing pest control that I've ever seen anything move quite as fast or change quite as much as this one virus has over the last month, month and a half. Now, I, I'm not sure exactly why this has moved so fast unless it has to do with the Olympics being in, in South America. Uh, and, you know, just when you bring the world into that environment, that world doesn't stay there. It goes somewhere. And if you take that world and move it all the way across the world, those things have the potential to go with it. We see that with bugs all over the place. And that's most of what I'm going to talk about today is just those bugs that when I started in this business, I never heard of. This is uh, from CNN. This is one of the first things that, that came out. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Gutta, they made a public statement for CDC. Here's what we know about Zika. Some of it will frighten you, but maybe not as much as you think. It's a mosquito-borne virus, part of the same family as yellow fever, West Nile, chikungunya, and dengue. As things stand now, there is no vaccine to prevent Zika or a medicine to treat the infection. The most common symptoms include fever, rash, headaches, and red eyes. But 80% of people who get Zika won't even know they have it. That's right, they're only symptoms in one in five people. Now the virus is spreading quickly across Central and South America and the Caribbean. What makes Zika so scary is this alarming connection between the virus and microcephaly, that is babies being born with heads and brains that are too small. In Brazil and several other Latin American countries, they've become concerned enough they have asked women there not to get pregnant. In the United States, pregnant women are being told to postpone travel to any of these countries. In case you're curious, this is the bloodsucker everyone's after, the female Aedes aegypti. She's an aggressive biter that, unlike other mosquitoes, feeds mostly during the day. For example, she's different than the mosquitoes that transmit malaria who like to feed at night. That's important because bed nets won't help as much here. The best way to prevent infections is using insect repellent with DEET, wearing thick long sleeve shirts and long pants and staying inside in screened air conditioned areas as much as possible. So you already mentioned dinghy fever. Uh, symptoms similar to flu, you've heard. This comes from the same mosquito, Andes aegypti, which is what you may have heard or seen as better known as the tiger mos mosquito. Uh, there is some unique things about the tiger mosquito in that, that it's, it's more likely to bite during the day and not necessarily in the evening and morning hours like some of the others that are more associated with malaria. And so this one can actually can bite any time, but it is associated with uh, biting during the day, typically on the lower part of the body because it's in the grass lot. And uh, luckily we don't have to deal a whole lot with mosquitoes around here. We just don't have that, that issue that, uh, that you would have it at home. But as, as far as just on campus I'm speaking about, we don't, but uh, you know, if this stuff continues, it's, 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 it's gonna be a problem that we're gonna have to treat for. Uh, dinghy fever, uh, a lot of these symptoms are all the same. Uh, uh, while I was looking for this, I noticed that the, the big island in Hawaii, 250 cases of dinghy fever. You see, it was last month. 
250 cases. State of emergency. Now, if you're going to South America, Hawaii, you know, this stuff could, could eventually affect travel everywhere. So, uh, you got chikungunya. You may have heard a lot of that was started uh, next, you know, started really hitting last year. Start hearing a lot about it. So another, now all, all three of these diseases are associated with the same mosquito. So, you know, you see the symptoms there. Stiffness, headache, fatigue, nausea. It's all similar to, to uh, flu. And most of these mimic something that's similar and they're hard, not real easy to diagnose. The statement that uh, NPMA is a National Pest Management Association that we're part of, that they came out with, that uh, I, don't, I don't know when the last time I actually heard, see, saw a statement from the NPMA publicly out about Zika and chikungunya and dengue, dengue virus. Uh, National Pest Management Association is monitoring the situation closely, meaning basically they didn't know, we don't really know how widespread or, or how big this is going to be or what it is, but you know, they felt the need to, to get a statement out there in front of this to at least say, hey, we're looking at this, we, you know, we're on top of it, we're monitoring the situation, see? And a lot of the basic things that he talked about, uh, how to prevent this, we'll get into that a little further. And then the CDC came out with the, basically the same thing. Now, everybody wants to be outside. Everybody wants to, to do what they do, especially in East Tennessee. You know, could this eventually affect tourism in Sevier County, Blount County, Smoky Mountains? You know, University of Tennessee brings in a ton of camps. You know, could it eventually affect you know, who comes here? Uh, we'd like to think not. But so you, st you start talking about ways to prevent it. Well, the easiest way to prevent it at, you know, at home or anywhere is to get rid of the water. Now, water, a bottle cap will support 20 mosquito eggs. So, turn over every bottle cap you find. <laughs> find out what's around your house. Now, if you've got a lot of mosquitoes around your house, find out what's around there. Some of these things fly up to a mile. And if, you know, you've got a tire dump that's a mile away from your house, you might want to consider moving. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but there are things that you can do. You know, they're, they're requiring now a lot of times that when you dump tires, that they, that they put holes in them so that they won't hold water. Uh, just different things like that. You know, with, you know as, as sanitation becomes improved, recycling, all this stuff, you know, all this stuff's not laying, you know, more people are picking up their trash. You know. But then you get into natural things that hold water. Tree holes, magnolia leaves, one of the world's worst. Falls, when they dry out, they cut just like that. And if you ever get under a magnolia tree, it's a, it's a breeding ground for mosquitoes because it's dark, it's cool, it's damp, and the leaves hold water. So nobody in East Tennessee rakes up under a magnolia tree because they're hard to get under. And they're, they're you know, but that's a, a heck of a place for, for mosquitoes. Anything that holds water. You know, w rain barrels sit there and they say, well, you, they're closed. Well, there's gaps around the, you know, where, they, where it runs into the, to the rain. Ra uh, rain gardens. You know, our design, now we're doing rain gardens to prevent runoff. Well, they're holding water. And you, and you, and you, and you get mosquitoes that way. Ponds in your backyard. If, if you don't keep a fountain flowing in your pond, and the reason people put fountains in ponds and retaining things is to keep the water moving. And what happens is when the mosquito egg hatches and the larva comes up, it's got a little snout on it and it sticks its head through the, the water to get air. And that ripple drowns that larva. Talk about controls. 
you got peanut oil, you got uh, mosquito dunks, which is a Beatrix, and then you got, you know, foggers. We try to move in that direction, you know. We try to do what least affects the envir environment. You see a lot of these anymore with uh, pest control companies. It's a very effective way, but it's very hard to control. I don't know if you've ever seen a thermal fog fogger or not. Uh, you can fog a lot of area in a little bit of time. A lot of uh, counties, this, this is a handheld unit. What the county uses is basically on the back of a, uh, of a truck, and it just puffs out as it goes. It's just a, it, uh, this guy on the, uh, on, over here on your right is uh, putting out an adult side, which is a, kind of a new thing. It just, uh, as it dissolves in that, in that, where this water stands, as it dissolves and goes out to the edge, it'll affect the uh, eggs and keep them from maturing.